Welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast, the podcast where we explore the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. Join us as we delve into topics such as consciousness, spirituality, and personal growth with expert guests and thought-provoking discussions. Get ready to expand your mind and discover new insights on this journey of self-discovery. Now here's your host, Peter Michael Deeds. I'm really thrilled today to introduce our guest of honor, Cindy Buckley, whose remarkable book, Love Awakens You, is nothing short of an extraordinary journey into self-discovery and transformation. And in this remarkable piece of work, Cindy takes us through various sections, each more enlightening than the last. Yes, I have read the book. And There are inspirational sayings where you can immerse yourself in nuggets of wisdom that serve as beacons of inspiration, which to my mind set the tone for the transformative journey ahead. You have live verses. These verses are eloquent and concise. And Cindy navigates the complexities of life, offering profound insights in just a few lines. And she also goes on to delve into the answers to life's intricate questions, exploring topics from individuality to forgiveness and providing clarity on the path to self-awareness. And that's just the beginning. Cindy invites us to embrace meditation and encouraging us to open our hearts, remember our true home and connect with our guides for a deeper understanding of ourselves. As well as that, there's a section on reflections, which touch on the choices we make, the tranquility of nature, and the profound impact of a peaceful way. And for me, the pinnacle is a prayer for oneself and humanity, which I've found a powerful piece that resonates with the collective aspirations for love and peace. And these meditations and reflections are not just words on pages, They are gateways to profound shifts in perspectives, opening our minds to acceptance, truth, universal love, and abundance. Cindy Buckley's book is a tapestry of insights and practices that will undoubtedly leave an indelible mark on your soul. Cindy, welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Hello, Peter. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh my God, that was so well said and written. I hope I live up to all that. (laughs) It's just beautiful. Amazing. So eloquent with words. I like to do my research and I delved into the book when I was in the States and read through it and amidst all the chaos of traveling, it brought some sort of coherence out of chaos and gave me space. I could push back the space to envelop and embrace and embody what you wrote in the book, which is fantastic. Can you delve deeper into the role of spirituality in your journey, especially the significance of of crystals and energy healing? Oh my, that's a huge subject, which I absolutely love. (laughs) I say that, but you have to understand and people don't understand until they actually see it. I have a very large collection of crystals really large. I absolutely love them. They are an embodiment of love. Now, they are basically three things that people use or connect to help remind them of God, higher self, intuition, pick whatever you like, Holy Spirit, pick a term, it doesn't matter to me. There are three things that people use that really helps remind them the connection to their higher selves. One is birds. Two is flowers. Three is crystals. Now, for me, crystals embody a frequency and a sound color, and they all just mush together, and they help lift us up. That's why I like crystals. I always recommend people to have four basic crystals. I call it my starter kit. And the first one is rose quartz for self-love, moonstone 
the ivory colored one, which is good for helping to soothe your emotions. Black tourmaline, which helps to negate negativity and grounds you. And selenite, because that's very clearing. It just clears out and it just clears out and it really does clear out everything. It's wonderful. Our bodies are almost like a crystalline structure and the crystals can mirror that. Some crystals give, some crystals receive, depending on what your situation is. And you just use what you're guided to and you use them. I've seen your collection and it is huge. There's a lot of crystals in your house. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. You mentioned A Course in Miracles and the disappearance of the universe, which suggests a shift in your spiritual exploration. How did these influences shape the direction of your writing? My writing is inspired by A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles is about forgiveness. That's all it's about, really. But it's about the type of forgiveness that the current world doesn't acknowledge. It's about recognizing and understanding that no one has done anything wrong, that we are all innocent. And that's a tough thing to, un- to go through, because suppose you know someone who got murdered. You have to forgive the murderer for murdering that person, knowing that they really didn't do anything wrong. That's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people. Mm. And the more you practice forgiveness, the easier it becomes to do that. I have a blog that's going to be coming out shortly that says, repetition is your best friend. Mm -hmm. You can't shift from fear to love without some... Now, my book starts the process. It really does release fear. It's like an onion. It peels away the layers of things that no longer serves you. Crystals do the same thing. A Course in Miracles does that. All of these things do it slowly because you need to do it slowly. The Big Bang thing doesn't work. You'll just revert back to the way you were. You want to change your mindset slowly. You try and do it quickly or fast, and guess what? You're going to end up reverting back because you didn't really get it the first or second or third Big Bang try. You want to be able to Make sure it sinks in and stays with you and you adjust to the change. And guess what? When you're adjusting to the change, you're taking everyone else with you. I'm smiling. I'm very animated. It's soon ripe, soon rotten. Everybody wants everything really quick these days and lack of cultivation of patience to see a process through is very limited because there's such a huge machinery of distraction out there vying for people's time and energy and focus. And people get hypnotized by all of that. And when you read something like Love Awakens, one of the things that I was reading about unveiling the essence of truth, because that narrative posits that truth extends far beyond the confines of perceived reality. And it also challenges the common held belief that We are defined by the bodies that we inhabit. So there's an assertion that the identification with the body is a chosen perspective, self-imposed limitation, if you will, that really veils the profound truth of one's existence. And it contends that the, the preoccupation with the body is a common misconception. And I I think this belief is rooted in the ego's influence because that always leads to a very skewed perception of reality, one that places undue importance on the external, material, gravitational aspects of existence. How does the narrative challenge the conventional understanding of identity tied to the body? And what role does the ego play in shaping our perspective, our perceptions of suffering and the significance of the body. I'm going to say a whole lot of controversial things the next right. few Go minutes. For it. First of all, the body does not exist. Okay. We're in a body because we're in fear. However, having said that, in order to get back to love, we have a whole lot of lessons to learn to get back to true kindness and compassion. 
And once we learn those lessons, then we quote unquote reach enlightenment, which you can only reach when you're in a body. And then you can leave permanently, but not until then. And that takes a few thousand lifetimes. Mm. And the second thing that's terribly controversial that I'm about to say is there is no world. This world was created by ego, by us, because we chose to experience leaving God's love. And while we're experiencing it, we can't go back until we learn all our lessons and be able to have true kindness, compassion, love, patience, integrity, honesty, all those things that embody love. Everything else is fear. So once we truly believe all that and know that, then you start to realize, what's my purpose here? My purpose here is to be the light of God. I am here to help others. And while I'm helping others, I'm helping myself at the same time. It's called the mirror effect. If something someone does irritates you, that's because there's a belief inside of you that's probably unconscious that needs to be resolved. That's a healing of some sorts. The biggest shock to me, this is the next thing that's probably controversial, the biggest shock to me was when I read in The Disappearance of the Universe that energy was the device of ego. And do you know why? Because it can change. Anything that's changeable in any way, shape, or form is ego. Love never changes. I had the experience once where I was driving, I had a truck at the time, and I was driving in my truck, and I was home, and all of a sudden, this absolutely overwhelming feeling came over me that I knew with utmost certainty that I loved everyone. Didn't matter. And along with that, I also knew there was no such thing as duality. This is a high that cannot be experienced through drugs or oxygen. It's a gift. Granted, it only lasted for three, four days. Didn't matter. Nothing could bother me. Nothing. My husband, people, nothing could bother me. And I'm trying to get back to that. But I got to learn my lessons. But I got a taste of what it was like. It's a gift. And I hope everyone gets to experience it because it's so profound and powerful and basically indescribable. I tried to describe it. That's what we're aiming for. We can only get there when we help other people because we're helping ourselves at the same time. Because when you do forgiveness, you forgive the other person and you forgive yourself at the same time. And you recognize that they're innocent and this is a dream and we made it up. So I said a few controversial things. I like controversial. I don't want to hear the kind of cultural yuck that people spew out. That is just the norm because it's something that they've taken on board and they use their brain as good data storage and they can vomit it out when somebody asks them and they can go, check, here's the answer. Whereas what we need is a different perspectival lens on the nature of reality. I don't think it is controversial, but it is controversial for most people. To my mind, I think absolutely it's an opportunity to explore these things and look at the whole dynamic of love and fear and how it sits in our egos, which tends to sit on the throne of hubris. Somebody was saying to me the other day, they were showing me an image of the Andromeda galaxy, which they can actually, you can actually see it now. It's not just a bunch of dust. And we think that we are the only living beings in the Milky Way. We may well be, but how many other galaxies are there? We're not the only living beings in the Milky Way. And there are tons of galaxies. There's even, we're in one universe. We're universes. There's galaxies within the universe, and then there's other universes. They have galaxies. It's like a bubble-up effect. 
it builds. It's like everything's designed to be fractured. And when everything's fractured, then you get to have all these experiences. It's not until all those pieces come back together. I use the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle. You, When you put the jigsaw puzzle together, you have the picture of the whole. But in the meantime, there's all kinds of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And until it all gets together, it's not a whole. That's what we are. We're pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. We're helping to return everyone to the whole. I remember being in the Joshua tree and somebody said to me, why are you going there? It's just rocks and trees. And I'm like, no, actually it's more than that to me anyways. And in that 800,000 square miles of desert at night, when you look up at the stars, it looks like God has thrown confetti into the sky. And the awe and wonder, if you start zooming out from Earth, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 100 miles, 1,000 miles, a million miles, you realize you're just this little dot in the middle of this vast universe. For me, it's the awe and wonder of what this temporary appearance is, if indeed it is temporary, on this planet. And what is this vast universe? that we all live within, and it lives within us. Exciting. A perennial wonderment. It's something that I contemplate often, and it doesn't matter that I don't have an answer, because I, I won't have an answer, but all I do have is there's a beauty to it. When you look up at that night sky, I can't even articulate what it is, but there's such an elegance to it and such a beauty to it and such an unknown. And it seems like it's unfinished. I suppose it is in a way. Yeah. And when I think about the interplay of light, dark, and if we consider the connections between emotional states and the play of light and dark, in your expertise, how can individuals intentionally cultivate lightness in their heart to foster a more positive and loving environment around them. First, read the book, Love Awakens You, by me. It will help start your process. Sorry, I have to do the plug. It's the thing you do. The second thing, which is even more important, is to connect to your intuition, which is what this book helps you to do. It actually unlocks, it literally does unlock different parts of you. And it helps you to connect to your intuition. And when you are connected to your intuition, you will be guided to what is best for you. But not only are you guided to what is best for you, you are guided to what is best for everyone. If you're happy, other people will be happy. If you're not happy, guess what? Other people aren't happy. Every one of us affects everyone else. Read the book, connect to your intuition. I actually have a saying that you can say it's simple and quite effective. It'll be in the second book. And that is, I am always safe and protected. Say it. It's all you have to do. You just have to say it. Say it frequently. And you also want to say it when you feel happy or things are going well, because that reinforces the good. And say it when things aren't going well, because it helps to lift you up out. Simple. Easy, effective. Those are probably my three big recommendations. If you'd like more, I could come up with them. That's valid. The more you practice something, the more density you build. The more density you build with practice, like anything, the more it determines your destiny. It points you to a pathway, but you have to build the density in order for it to connect and inform your destiny. Repetition is your best friend. You cannot exactly. get away without it. In your narrative on a guided path to self-discovery, love awakens you, not only inspires, but also provides a structured guide for readers to embark on a transformative journey of self-discovery. And I know it's divided into sections, but for me, the book encouraged a slow and deliberate approach, allowing each part to have a profound and lasting impact. And you emphasize the importance of taking the time 
to absorb and integrate the wisdom imparted in each section. Can you elaborate on the decision to structure the book into sections and the significance of progressing through them in a specific order? Yes, actually I can. It was designed to be the way it is. And the whole point is to do it slowly. The first section, inspirational sayings are one-line verses, and they're based on universal truths. To read like a page or two a day, not any more than that, because if you think about it, it took us eons to get into fear. Guess what? It's going to take a while to get out of fear. You can't do it overnight. I suppose it's technically possible, very unlikely. Our brains cannot handle that much light and change all at once. We just can't. So the inspirational sayings, the single line verses set the stage for you to say, wow, I like that one. I don't like that one. Doesn't matter. You read it and it's going to have an effect on you one way or the other the ones that are negative, you probably should focus on a little bit more because it triggered something inside of you. The four-line verses are more in-depth spiritual sayings, uh, inspirational sayings, and they go a little bit deeper because they're designed to go, wow, I don't have a single line that I can remember. I got four lines now. And it just opens the door just a little more. The answer section is designed to get people to look at things in a different way, not in the traditional earth human way of looking at things. We're trying to elevate your spirit to universal truths. And when you get elevated to universal truths and open up to spirit and your guidance, life gets a whole lot easier and a whole lot easier. Whoa, I never would have thought of that possible. And it just happens. It comes. It takes practice, but it does come. The meditations were designed to give people something to do. People like something to do because you don't need to do any journaling or affirmations or any self-help techniques. It's not designed that way. It's designed for you to read the book slowly. But people like things to do, so it's helpful to have someone read the meditation to you. Trying to do it by yourself is, you can do it, but it's always helpful to have someone read it to you. And the reflections are just a different way to look at things like nature or our destination or a peaceful way or a prayer for our oneself and humanity. It's just to get you to open up, to realize It's not just about you. It's about everyone. And I highly recommend reading it slowly. You can whiz through it. You won't get it. And some people have tried to go whiz through it. You can try. Either your head will spin, you'll get overwhelmed because it does unlock parts of you to open you up by reading the words. I know that's hard to understand and most people find that new and different, but it is designed that way. Language is coded. And if people start to understand the etymology of words, the tone of words, the real significance and meaning of words, but also their vibration and their frequency and how that impacts your neurology, because we now know that if you build the practice, the consistency, and you build that density, certain neurons will wire together. This is why people say you can't unsee what you see. It's because those neurons are wired together. Neurons that are wired together fire together. So the practice is really important. And understanding that it has a penetrative aspect to it, which starts to unfold depending on how you're arranged, where you're at in your life, and so on and so forth. So I certainly resonate with that, especially after reading the book slowly myself because I read it over a period of a couple of months, which is still too fast in my view. I want to go back and reread it in a much slower and deliberate manner. One of the narratives, it answers to unasked questions. When I was looking at that, I thought to myself, that formed a cohesive circle, guided me back to self-awareness. And you emphasize the interconnectedness of the answers, 
which anyone reading it, it unlocks their true potential, illuminates the path to choosing love over fear. What inspired the concept of answering questions readers may not even know they had? I would ask questions to my guides. And for example, I said, what about inner child? And I got an answer. It was an answer to my question. So I decided if I had the question, someone else is going to have the question. Without asking the question, how about just providing them the answer? Because the answer gives them the question. It's up to them to figure out what their question is. These were my questions. And I had a few of them. Uh, in the second book, I talk about sex and a few. Uh, I talk about a lot of different things, psychic abilities. I go, I go even further now into the second book, which explains all these things. And again, a very different way of looking at them. And I had, what's love? And I'm like, then if what's this love, then there must be universal love. And then if there's God love. And I just had all these questions that I wanted answers to. And guess what? They answered them for me. And the idea was to give the answers to people so that they go, oh, I didn't know I had that question. This all just came from me having unusual questions. But I wanted to keep the answers to single words or no more than two words to keep them short. Because nowadays people have very short attention spans. They do. So why not make sure that it's only the answers are no more than a page and a half or maybe up to two pages or maybe just a page. But within those short pages is a very powerful message. The way the words are put together, you don't need a lot of words to keep explaining something. Those bite-sized chunks were not only potent but powerful. Once you start to embody and embrace those words, so not only read them, but you align yourself to them. And as you align yourself to them, they become part of your basic constitution. So it seeps into your sinews, if you will. And for me, I can feel the feelings of those words and they get into your cellular and molecular life. That's the way it felt. And another narrative, you talk about embracing immortality and you present inspirational sayings that delve into the timeless concepts of immortality. And again, for me, those sayings offered a fresh perspective on the idea of transcending physical existence and tapping into the inter eternal nature of the self. Your words encouraged me to ponder my own understanding of immortality and to consider how this concept can reshape my approach to my life. Within the concept of immortality, because it's often associated with religious or spiritual beliefs, how does your interpretation in these sayings align or differ from traditional perspectives? There are a lot of people that feel immortality is something you strive for in a body. And my answer is, hell no. Sorry, shouldn't swear. But hell no. I don't want to be here in a body. I do not want to be on this quote unquote, unmarry go around forever and ever. I want to get back to my true home. I want to get back to who I really am, which is spirit. Death is only the non-existence of a body. That's it. Your mind and spirit does continue to live on. If you have not learned all your lessons, your unconscious guilt is going to bring you back into a body, into a different lifetime, maybe here on the planet, maybe a different planet. I don't know. It's whatever your path is. And until you reach, quote unquote, enlightenment, which is only found in a body, you're going to be back. Mortality has nothing to do with the body. Absolutely nothing. The body is here as a communication device. You are communicating to yourself and to other people. What is it you want to communicate? Tell me. Do you want to communicate hate, fear, anger? Do you want to communicate kindness, compassion, honor? It's your choice. Now, when you make the choice, somewhere along the line, there has to be some sense of discontentment for you to turn to make the choice towards love to realize, oh, there must be a better way. There has to be something small. doesn't matter. Just something small that you think 
can't do this anymore. And I've done this many times throughout my life. This doesn't work for me. I need something better. And that's when pivotal changes start because you've opened yourself up to allow spirit to guide you. It doesn't have to be as simple as, all right, spirit, guide me, because generally that doesn't work. It has to be truly heartfelt. It has to be a true feeling of discontentment or knowing that there must be a better way. That's where it all starts. So no, immortality has nothing to do with the body. We want to think it does because that keeps us rooted here in fear. It's a whole industry. It's the whole world. To be honest, you can't live without this item or that item. I like peacocks. I just like peacocks. And I was looking on Amazon for something and a, a little ad popped up for a peacock. Honest to God, I'll show it to you. I had to have it. A completely, totally <laughs> frivolous thing. I look at it and to me, it is so beautiful and it's got gold and it came in different colors. I was only interested in the blue, but more traditional peacock colors. Totally frivolous. But you know what? It brings me a lot of joy. And you'll find when you've connected to your intuition, you're going to get rid of a lot of stuff. And that could be people, that could be things, it could be your way of thinking. And it's okay. You just have to learn to accept it. I've had a person in my life, a friend of mine, for 18 years. We no longer speak. She didn't want to continue to grow. And that's okay. I'm in a different path now. Things will happen. I realize more and more uh, with advancing years is that it's not so much what I can add to my life. It's more what I can subtract. And like you say, it could be people, it could be things, it could be anything, but thoughts, feelings, old behaviors, outdated habits, all these things you start to subtract. I feel I don't need anything materially. I don't need anything. Somebody said to me the other day, he said, so. If I parked an AMG Mercedes outside your house, you wouldn't want it. I said, I may want it, but I don't need it. My ego may want it, of course, but I don't need it. So I don't want it. It's that simple to me. I just don't need it. Whereas 30 years ago, when I bought my first BMW, I was like, oh, look at me. Hey, I'm the <laughs> business, right? I'm driving around London in this 325i brand new BMW that I'd saved and worked hard for. Whereas now when I look back at that, I, I have to laugh. I have to laugh myself. Who was that guy? <laughs> There's a narrative in your book and I'm picking out parts of the book because I found them. It's all amazing. It's all fascinating. But one of the things you talked about was transformation through love in this section. And he unfolds a series of inspirational sayings that revolve around the transformative power of love. And you beautifully articulate how love can be a catalyst for personal growth and positive change. And what I found in those sayings is that it helped me to reflect on my own experiences with love and for me to consider how embracing a mindset of love has led to profound transformation in my own life. This is a recurring theme in your book. Were there any specific experiences or insights that led you to emphasize the transformative power of love? I would say my own journey, basically, of realizing how when you hate and you're angry, it takes way more energy and it makes you way more tired than when you're happy and going with the flow, so to speak, and everything is going well, don't worry, the bumps in the road still continue. No matter how far in advance you think you are, you're still going to have bumps in the road. You go through them a lot easier with more ease and grace. Life, it's energizing. Fear is not. You get sick, you get tired. But with love, you're not any of those things. It's just very exciting. And you have a wonderment, a child wonderment of what's going to happen next. Instead of, I want this to happen. Go away with that. Expectations kills your inspiration. I say a lot of blunt lines like that in the book. And it really does. Don't have any expectations. And I know that's hard for a lot of people who want to set and plan 
But some days I get up, I don't have a plan and they come out better than anything. I, I couldn't have possibly imagined how good the day would have been. It doesn't mean you don't plan your life and family gatherings and things like that. Of course, you have to live your life and go out food shopping and that type of thing. But the big major things like I want a new car or I want a new house, maybe you're not supposed to get them. Leave that up to spirit to handle for you. For me, it's the difference between being preoccupied and being free occupied. And I've found when I'm free occupied, things start to come in that I may have missed or not even thought about. And all the maintenance stuff, yeah, you've got to have groceries, you've got to brush your teeth, you've got to take a poo. You've got to do all those things. Those are all part of the maintenance aspects of life. I may take a huge amount of time. Over 90% of your life is maintenance. That other to 10%, you can push back the space to invest in yourself and invest in your own journey and in your own self-worth and why you're here and what you're here to do on this planet. There's another narrative that comes to mind, which is the dance of light and shadow. And that for me, unveiled a collection of these inspirational sayings that explore the interplay between light and shadow in life. And you poignantly capture the dual nature of existence, which encouraged me to find harmony in, in embracing both the luminous and the darker aspects of my journey. And the words that came through you invite contemplation on how balance and acceptance can lead to a richer and more fulfilling life. And the concept of light and shadow is metaphorical and rich with symbolism. What inspired you to use this metaphor in your inspirational sayings? 18 years ago, I was going through a huge change. A friend gave me the disappearance of the universe. As soon as I read three pages, I said, oh my God, I have to get A Course in Miracles. So I did. I read The Disappearance of the Universe, A Course in Miracles, and I did the workbook and A Course in Miracles all at the same time. And I really wouldn't recommend that because your ego is going to get challenged and you're going to be fighting like crazy. And at the same time as I was doing all that, these inspirational sayings just started coming to me. They were pouring in. I'd be in a restaurant and I'd write it on a napkin. You should have seen the pieces of paper I had all over the place. In the middle of the night, I'd wake up with an inspirational saying, oh yeah, I'll remember it. No, I did not remember it. And that was the inspiration. They just mm -hmm. came pouring out. Literally, when I say pouring out, it was a busy couple of years, the four-line verses and the inspirational sayings. And I would say maybe between the reflections and the answers, I only had written maybe five or six of them. Most of the reflections I had written 18 years ago couple I wrote now, but I only had about three or four answers. I wrote the rest a year and a half ago. Yeah, they just started coming. So I wrote down and said, okay, I'm supposed to do something with them. And that was about a year and a half ago. Oh, I think you should something with them might be helpful for people. I never wanted to write a book, by the way. For someone getting a copy of this book, what would be your counsel? How would they navigate the challenges presented by the shadow aspects of life while still embracing the light. That's your intuition. It'll help you release and navigate. I can't stress that enough. I know I've said that three or four times throughout this, but I really do mean it makes a big difference because you're relieving yourself of the anguish of expectations and wanting something when it may not be what's best for you. Because the reality is we have no idea what we want. We think we want a new house. We want a bigger house. But the reality is we didn't count on the fact that, oops, it's bigger to clean. It costs more to maintain. A variety of things can happen. I use the house because everyone can associate that with the fact, or I want to be in a nice, fancy neighborhood. Oh, that's very expensive with the Homeowners Association fee. Your taxes have just gone up. Your insurance has just gone up. Did you think about those things? No, you just had this urge to get a bigger something, whatever it is. We don't know what we want because we don't have the whole picture. We have no idea what's going on in and around us. 
Holy Spirit is the person, your higher self, God, whatever, is guiding us. They will guide us to what's best for ourselves and everyone else. And when you listen, and I can give examples when I haven't listened, very expensive and time-consuming examples. When you don't listen, you get yourself in trouble. How long do you want to suffer? That's the question. There are many poetic verses, but one of the verses that stood out for me goes like this. The stars up above shine bright. The sun shines down upon all. The glimmer of hope peeks through the brightness of love encompasses all. And I found in these times of a chaotic world, you weave a tapestry of celestial imagery that invokes a luminous beauty of the stars above and the radiant warmth of the sun. And I found there was this glimmer of hope that was portrayed as a delicate yet persistent force that pierces through life's challenges. And what really stood out for me is the overarching theme of love depicted as a bright and encompassing presence that unifies all aspects of existence. So I was invited to contemplate the interconnectedness of the celestial and profound influence of love on the human experience. The question that comes up in me is, How can individuals draw inspiration from the celestial elements mentioned in the verse to find solace and hope in these challenging times? I have to say that's an excellent question. One that I'm not sure I have an answer for because it's going to be different for each person. It really is. Some people will reread the words and allow it to permeate them. Some people will. Yeah, I get it. Put it away. Six months later, it might affect them. They won't know it was the book, by the way. They won't even remember that. And for some people, they're just going to go, I really need to do this change. It has to happen. And it's got to happen now. And it will because they've opened the doorway. I don't think that really answers your question, but I, I don't know how to give you a better answer. Different for every person. I think it just poses another question, really. I think the question survives the answer. You have to answer the question yourself. Exactly. It's what it comes down to. Yeah. There was a saying by Rumi, we are simply walking each other home. Oh, I love that. I love that too. There's a narrative in your book, Rediscovering Home and That whole exploration of home, I was invited to reflect on the profound idea that home has never been lost, but only needs to be remembered. And this narrative unfolds the consequences of choosing a path of isolation and emphasizing the illusion of complete independence, because home is described as a place of support, of camaraderie and love, where one's true self is embraced, and you challenge the belief that one can do everything alone and beckons readers to return home, reconnect with their family, rediscover the sense of belonging that was never truly lost. How does your portrayal of home challenge societal notions of independence and the belief in complete self-sufficiency? First of all, you are never alone. Absolutely never, ever alone. Everybody has a guardian angel. That's the one a a guy that stays with you through your whole lifetime. But then you have a whole lot of other guides that come and go depending on where your growth is and what you're doing. I will tell you myself, loneliness is a very big thing in people's lives, which I think touches on what you're asking. When I was a teenager, I would say maybe two, three, four times I felt lonely. But in general, I never feel loneliness. I am never alone. No one is ever alone. Now, you can choose to do self-sufficiency on your own. Suppose you want to go live off the grid. You want to experience that. You don't want to depend on anybody else. You're living in fear when you're doing that in a lot of respects because you're afraid that somebody else is going to control your life and your outcome. 
On the other hand, maybe you choose to live off the grid because you need the solitude to grow. It's a two-edged sword. Pick the middle of the sword. Don't pick the edges. They're too sharp. The middle. And suppose you live in an area. I live in the Phoenix, Arizona area. We have a really severe drought. And pretty soon, maybe we're going to have water restrictions. And that's just going to happen. I chose to live here. I'll have to adjust. My trees may not survive this drought if I can't water them, but you know what? Everything changes. You move on. You have to learn to accept the changes. You have to change to meet your requirement. The way I see home, it's a place of support and love. And for individuals listening to this or reading your book, How can they foster a sense of home in their personal lives, even in the absence of traditional family structures? That starts with them. That starts with learning to love yourself, which is easier said than done. I will admit that up front. And to have a sense of home is knowing you're never alone. To have a sense of home, to know you belong to your soul group, whatever that is. Maybe you don't find them this lifetime. Maybe you do. Either way, they're out there and they are supporting you. Maybe they're unseen, but they are still supporting you. They are helping you always. I will clarify all that with saying all of our guides and angels cannot help us unless we ask. You must ask for help. They can't help because they don't want to interfere with your choices unless you say, I made a bad choice. What do I do? I need help. Guess what? They will help you. Now, the challenge will be accepting the help, hearing the help, knowing what the help is. It takes practice, but you will get there. Just start with something small. Ask a question. Do I want coffee or tea this morning? It's very simple, but ask the question. And say, I, I, I want to know, do I need, want coffee or tea this morning? And you'll get a feeling, you'll hear something, you'll get a knowing, you'll just go, oh, I feel like tea. Don't dismiss it that you think that was yourself that gave you the answer. You asked the question, they gave you the answer. That's what would be best for you today. Have a cup of tea. Hmm. Don't have the coffee. Maybe tomorrow you'll have the coffee. There's some simple things that are most effective. Yeah, you start with the simple things and the bigger things, believe it or not, start to fall into place. I'll give you an example. My husband and I went to go see this Christmas show and it was in a spring training baseball stadium and they had irregular steps. And I got to the second to the last step. They were small little narrow steps, set my shoe caught on the last step and it was a big, large step. I literally landed on the concrete smashed my nose, my knees. I had a concussion for three days. I did not look so good, but I asked for help. And just eight days later, everything is healed. I didn't go to the hospital. They weren't going to do anything for it if my nose was broken. My nose was not broken. It's still a little tender, so I still have to work on it a little bit. And I'm still asking for help. Miracles can happen. Eight days, that really is like a two to three week process to heal. Ask for help. Start small, even to give yourself confidence that you got the message. There's a philosophical question there. What what does it mean to ask? It means you're willing to accept help. It's simple, but it's profound. Yeah. I don't like the word surrender. You're not giving up anything. You're not surrendering anything. All you're doing is accepting help. Mm. I was touched and moved and inspired by a prayer for oneself and humanity. And I found the essence of that very simple, but profound. The wish for humanity to recognize the luminous core residing within, to feel that warm embrace of self-love. And to realize the innate beauty woven into the fabric of existence. For me, it was a call for growth beyond the boundaries of imagination. It was an invitation to bask in the radiant glow of joy and peace and love that patiently 
awaits acknowledgement. And as it unfolded, I found the imagery of light took center stage. And what I can see is for each person, for each individual to become a radiant beacon. So their essence is filled with that wonder and awe, but at the abundance of support and love that surrounds them, there was a plea for the spirit to intimately acquaint itself with the soul to bring about a profound oneness with the highest vibrations that unite the collective, countless souls on the journey of growth and expansion. There was a reminder in there for me. There was a reminder that each one of us are seekers in a way of light and love. It's almost like an invocation to transcend the need for external sources of knowledge and direction and guidance, but recognizing that their inherent capacity to be loving beacons of light. So for me, there's a culmination of this prayer, which I wrote down the threshold of a new beginning, a beginning that holds the promise of a transformed and transcendent way of being for all. How does the prayer envision the transformation of individuals and their connection with light and love? And what significance does the imagery of light hold in the prayer? Prayer is the light. The prayer is the light. That's the significance. If you read it and truly connect to it, you've gotten it. You've gotten the message that we are all light. We're the lighthouses. We're the beacons to help people home. That's what the purpose of the prayer is, to help people to realize that they are the light. This has been quite a journey in reading Love Awakens. Revelations emerges, and there's a revelation about the dichotomy of human emotions. Because like you say, human beings are capable of experiencing only two emotions, love and fear. Fear, the narrative suggests that it manifests in, in various forms, and you talk about anger and hate and despair and guilt and, and worry, while love stands as a singular force and doesn't change, but it's a singular force with transformative power. I found this a real companioning in the exploration of love and fear because it, it brought me a heightened awareness of the distinctions between these emotions. There are many rewards when you make that shift. And the other thing was that embedded in the conclusion, and this is my view, is a recognition of a growing collective, a rising tide of individuals opening themselves up to love and opening themselves up to authenticity. And the conclusion ends with a benediction, a heartfelt wish for the reader's journey to be filled with love and light and for their inner light to become a shining beacon and their beautiful soul to blossom and for the enduring choice of love in every facet of life. How does the conclusion frame the duality of human emotions and their impact on personal well-being? The conclusion is, to metaphorically speaking, is a beginning. This is your journey. This is the beginning of your journey. I have a number of issues, health issues and whatever, and my story is helpful and hopeful. But I started thinking, how can I help people do this themselves? It doesn't do much good for people to hear stories. And yes, it might be helpful, but sometimes we get drawn into the gossip and the story of everybody else's life. And yeah, they did it so I can do it, but they don't know how to do it. Mm. And so this is what the book is about. The book is to help teach you to open you up to your higher guidance so that you can learn to do things yourself. You can learn to make that step. Others can show you the path, the way, but only you can walk the path. That is just the way it is. I want to thank you so much, Sydney, because I want to extend my deepest gratitude for sharing what for me was a profound wisdom and transformative insights encapsulated in Love Awakens You. And your words have certainly touched my heart and illuminated my path to the commitment and continual endeavor to self-discovery and your dedication to guiding others through the intricacies of life and fear and love 
and beyond is truly commendable. And the journey you've taken us on today is one of introspection, healing. And there's a beautiful reminder in all of this, indeed, that love does awaken us to the fullness of our existence. I don't know what sort of takeaways people will, will have from this, but for me, it's the power of choice. In every moment, we can either choose love over fear, understanding over judgment, acceptance over denial. I see this as a catalyst for personal growth. And there's a gentle reminder in all of this that each one of us holds the key to unlocking a more profound connection with ourselves and the world around us. I really want to thank you for your invaluable contribution to this collective journey of self-discovery and love. Do you have any passing words and where can people find you? Oh, yes. I would like to highlight one of the sayings in the book. I think it might be apropos. Our greatest growth comes from facing our greatest fears. And it is a saying to help remind you that don't stay in your fear, step away and step out. And even if you're only guided to help one person, guess what? That means everything. You don't have to be on a stage doing stuff, making huge contributions. It could be something as simple as bringing a friend a cup of tea or a rose. There are small kindnesses. There is no kindness that goes unnoticed. So start with something simple and just keep going with the flow. You can reach me at my website, Cindy, C-I-N-D-I, Buckley, B-U-C-K-L-E-Y dot com. You could also reach me on LinkedIn or Facebook. And the book's available on Amazon. Beautiful. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me on your show. I really enjoyed this. It was just a lot of fun. What was your experience of today? I got to meet somebody who really got the book. It was very enjoyable to know that someone read it and realized all the potential in the book. It's quite lovely because I don't often get a lot of validation of what I do. I just do it because I'm guided to do it. But validation is something I've had to learn to let go. So this was a great validation for me to know that it was helpful and I see great things for you coming up. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of Transcendent Minds. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of the mysteries of the mind and of the human experience. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you feel inclined, please leave a rating and a review as this goes a long way. And follow us on social media to stay up to date with the latest episodes. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, keep transcending your mind.